Well, good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. Glad you made your way here. We are delighted to have you gathering for worship with us today. Uh, normally, I would welcome the folks online, but uh, our internet is down, and so I'll welcome those of you who are watching this tape delayed, I guess, later on, and we will get that up for you. But we're delighted that you've come. If you are a guest with us, we especially want to welcome you. I encourage you, if you would stop by our Welcome Center and pick up the gift that we have for you back there, we would be delighted to have you do that. I would ask that all of you take the opportunity to fill out this slip that's in your bulletin or use the QR code that's on it to register the fact that you're here today. You can also use this to sign up for various events that I'll be mentioning. There are a lot of uh, announcements in the bulletin that I want you to pay special attention to. But especially if you are here and planning to attend pizza with the pastors, that is just up the ramp out here and to the right in our fellowship hall. If this is your first service with us, uh, we would invite you, even if you didn't get a chance to sign up, to join us for that informal time of just getting to know who our staff is. Uh, next Sunday is our baptism and church picnic and family meeting. That will be after the morning service. All the information about that is in the bulletin. We do encourage you to sign up because we want to make sure we have enough ice cream. So if you want to eat ice cream, we need you to sign up for next Sunday. It'll be an exciting afternoon after the baptism and the meeting are over. You're free to stay and play any of the games that we'll have out or bring games with you that we can play and fellowship together on that day. The following Sunday, August the 7th, is our youth service. Our young people will re be reporting on the various things they've been doing this summer and taking charge of the service. And then Outreach Sunday will be that afternoon as we spread out to various venues in the city to minister in the name of Christ and show the love of Christ. All that information, the opportunity to sign up is in your bulletin as well. Discover Berean, we're doing a one day, uh, one afternoon class on Sunday afternoon, August the 21st, where you have the opportunity to learn more about who we are. And if you want to join with us in membership or you can come and attend with no obligation, we would be glad to have you do that again. You can sign up uh, following the instructions in the bulletin. All of the ministries that we do happen because you give faithfully, and we want to thank you for that. We could not do uh, any of the things that we carry out unless you are giving, whether it's online or offering envelope or however you choose to do that. Uh, thank you, and please continue to do so. Let's bow in prayer together, shall we, as we begin the service? Father, we rejoice in your goodness to us. We rejoice in your grace that is abundant, that has brought us here to this place today. Thank you for that. Thank you for life. Thank you for physical life, that we're able to be up and here. Thank you more than that for spiritual life, for those of us who know Christ and have trusted in his work for our salvation. Thank you for the many, many willing workers that we have throughout the building even right now. Thank you for those who minister in our children's ministry, who were in the Sunday school hour teaching, and those who are working in kids' church right now, and in our nurseries, Lord, we thank you for them. We thank you for those who worked in Action Day Camp and the Carnival, and those who will be working in Awana and in youth groups, and all the things that will be coming this, this fall as well, Lord. We are blessed to have people who love children and love to care for children and minister to children, and we thank you for them. We thank you, Father, for Outreach Sunday coming up and for Youth Sunday coming up, and we pray that those days would be a blessing to us as a church body, but a blessing to our community as well. And this morning, as we gather in freedom, Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who don't enjoy these freedoms. We pray for those in China, those in Russia, those in North Korea, in Iran, in other places in the Middle East. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine who are undergoing having their homes destroyed many of them and struggling to make ends meet thank you for the opportunity we've had and others have had to minister to them thank you father for so much you have given to us that we often take for granted we ask now as we gather in your name that you would meet with us that you would encourage us that as we worship you as we interact with each other and encourage one another that we might be built up in the faith we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you're glad to be in the Lord's house today together, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. His name is worthy to be praised. We do welcome you in Jesus' name. And as Pastor prayed 
So much goes on behind the scenes, many people working in various ministries, and we are so grateful, uh, and so grateful for Larry Albert and his musicians, and our tech team, and the weekly faithful ministry that they give week after week, serving the Lord, and uh, we just give God great praise, because he's worthy of our praise, amen? We are to give him our best from our hearts, and he is so gracious to us every day. His mercies are new every morning. Would you stand together with me as we enter into his presence corporately, singing as a congregation from our hearts to his. We begin this morning with scripture as we move into our worship package of songs, giving praise to our great God. Would you join with me together in strong voice saying, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. By heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God, oh, praise His name for us.
pastor continues his series in Habakkuk, bringing us to Habakkuk chapter 3. Verse 2 reads, O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and the work, your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And thank God he does. He is a merciful God. Would you stand together as we sing? Two, three, four. If God is for us, who can be against us? Thank God for his mercy. We will fear the battle. We will fear the night. We will walk the fire. We will be by our side. You will go before us. You will lead the way. We have found a refuge. So we can say. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortune. Raise your voice now. The Lord is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake, you will cheer me on with never ending grace. We joy now, our God is for us. The thought is love, is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, the Lord is greater. Look and stand against us if our God is for us. Neither height nor depth can separate. So with him, graciously give us all things. Amen and amen. Father, bless the preaching of your word. Open our hearts and our wills to what you have for us today, we pray in Jesus' name. And again, all of God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So I don't know who else needed that song this morning, but uh, I did. I told the worship team. I needed that song. We walked in this morning, of course, to no internet, and then there were a few other complications, and so I was actually standing back there when they were singing, saying, you know, neither no internet or no back screen, nothing can separate us from the love of God. <laughs> it's good to remember that. We're going to see a song this morning that Habakkuk wrote that teaches us great theology and and I so appreciate Pastor Steve's songs that he chooses that teach us great theology. That's important. And I, I want to encourage you, as we move through the text this morning, watch for themes that you sang popping up in the text as well. I want to introduce you this morning to a man by the name of Charles Jackson. 
Charles Jackson was convicted in 1991 of murder and attempted murder. For 28 years in prison, he persisted in claiming that he was innocent. And on July 11th of this year, a judge agreed that he was indeed wrongfully convicted and released him. He was 27 when he was jailed. His daughter, who's standing with him, is now 27. He says this, I'm relieved all those years to be labeled as a monster and to live through that and to feel shame and humiliation and now to be totally exonerated. It feels good. I bet it does. You know, Habakkuk has been talking about wanting to be totally exonerated. He's been talking about the evil in his nation, in Judah, and, and why doesn't God do something about that evil? And then God tells him, I'm going to. I'm going to send the Babylonians. And he says, wait a minute. The Babylonians are more evil than we are. How can you use them? And last week we saw part of the answer, though all of Habakkuk's questions are not being answered. Part of the answer is that evil contains within itself the seeds of its own destruction. We looked at those five woes and we saw the bottom line of all of them is that God will judge sin. And now we reach Habakkuk chapter 3. If you have your Bibles or your electronic devices, you can turn there with me. Habakkuk chapter 3 shows us a prophet whose whole outlook has changed. He's seeing things now differently than he did before. In fact, the book takes such a dramatic turn that some of the critics say, well, Habakkuk didn't write chapter 3. It's too different from the other two chapters. But chapter 3 is poetry. Poetry never sounds the same as prose. Poetry always uses different language. In fact, it's more than poetry. It is a song, as I mentioned earlier. We know that because in verse 1, he talks about it being according to Shiganoth. And we don't even know what Shiganoth is other than it occurs in Psalm 7 as a musical term. So it's some kind of a musical term. In verses, in verses 3, 9, and 13, he uses the word selah. We see selah throughout the Psalms. It means probably to stop and think about what's been said. And then when he comes to the end of the book in verse 19, where the Lord willing we will get next week, he says, I've written this for the choir master to be played on the strings. So what we're looking at this morning is a song. It's a song that's not always easy to interpret. Uh, you will have a study Bible, perhaps, that will have footnotes throughout this that say something like this. The meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. It's because some of these are rare words. And you may have a translation different than the ESV that I am using that will translate some of the phrases a little differently. But the overarching theme is the same. We can divide this song up by using pronouns. Sometimes people ask me, how do you come up with what you come up with? Well, sometimes I wonder that too. But Habakkuk makes it easier for us because he divides this song up by using different pronouns. In the first two verses, we're going to see him use words like I and me. In verses 3 through 7, he talks about God and he. In verses 8 through 15, he'll direct his words to God and say you a lot of the time. And then in the passage we'll look at next week, he comes back around in verses 16 through 19 to I and me again. And so we're going to use those divisions to look at this text together. Because what Habakkuk is teaching us in this song is some things that he is sure of, some certainties. There are still a lot of questions Habakkuk has, still a lot of things that he doesn't know. But he says, here are some things that I have learned and that I do know. And we've seen the first one earlier in the book. When God and the world don't make sense, here's a certainty. God hears the prayers of his people. We saw that back in chapter 1, Habakkuk starts the book by praying. Here we've just come out of chapter 2, verse 20, where God is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And because God is enthroned in his temple, Habakkuk knows he can cry out to him. In fact, the very first word of his prayer, after we get by the little uh, description of what it is, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianoth, Lord, 
The first word is the covenant name of God, Jehovah, Yahweh. And it occurs a few words later. Lord, I've heard the report of you. And your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so in this prayer, he is crying out, bowing before the covenant God of Israel and saying, God, I need you. In essence, he's come to accept the fact that we must humbly accept what God is doing. We may not always like it. We may not always understand it. But we humbly accept what he's doing. Habakkuk is no longer wrestling with God. Chapter 3 contains no questions from Habakkuk to God. He's given up with his expectations of what he thinks God ought to do. He's come to grips with the fact that God really does know better how to run his world than Habakkuk does, and then you do, and then I do. There's a meme I've seen on Facebook, you may have seen it other places on the internet, that simply says, if you want to make God laugh, just tell him your plans. Because somehow we think we know best. And what Habakkuk has has had to come to grips with is that we really don't know best and that we have to humbly bow before God and accept what he's doing. Habakkuk says, I've heard the report of you. God has been talking to Habakkuk throughout the book. And he says, now I understand more about you. I've heard the report. What's interesting to me is this report of God about who he is and what he's doing, it's the word of God being given to Habakkuk. By the time we reach chapter 3, Habakkuk's faith has been stretched. Habakkuk's faith has grown. And Paul tells us that's how it happens, right? Because faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. Habakkuk says, I've heard what you've been saying, God. And I've heard what you've said about what you're going to do. And Lord, I fear. Maybe better, Lord, I stand in awe of what you plan to do. Because you are on your throne. Back in chapter 1, God had said to Habakkuk in verse 5, If I told you all that I am going to do, you wouldn't believe it. Now Habakkuk's heard a little piece of what God's going to do, and he says, I'm standing in awe of that plan. We must humbly accept what God is doing. But that doesn't change the second part of what Habakkuk has learned, and you and I need to apply. And that is, we can humbly petition God for help. Yes, we bow before what he is doing, but it's not wrong for us to say, God, I understand you are doing something I can't fully grasp. Your ways are higher than my ways. But here's what I'm asking of you. Notice what Habakkuk says. In the midst of the years, and he repeats that phrase in a minute. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. The idea of revive is really bring to life. He's saying, God, would you bring your plan to life? Would you make it known? Would you carry out your will? May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus taught us to pray. But then he also says, remember mercy. He's really asking for God to do a work of deliverance among his people, as he did in the past. Do it again. And he's about to recount for us some of the ways God has shown his mercy in the past. But God, I know you're going to pour out wrath. But in that wrath, be merciful. We don't deserve it, but be merciful. He's he's counting on and calling on the character of God. One of the fundamental Old Testament statements about God is that he's merciful. The Lord, the Lord God, gracious and merciful, abundant in mercy and grace and truth. The revelation of God that he gave to Moses in Exodus 34 that carries through the whole Old Testament. And Habakkuk says, God, please be merciful to your people even as your wrath comes. See, when the world doesn't make sense, when God doesn't make sense, we pray. We pray because we know certainly that he hears us. 
In his book, Touch and Live, George Vandeman tells a story of a, a young man who was hiking in the Alps. And he had two guides with him to help him. And as they were climbing one particularly very steep, very high summit, they neared the top and the first guide stepped aside so that the young man could be the first to catch the, the, the vision of the beautiful vista. But in his excitement, the young man forgot some of the training he'd been given. He forgot that when you reach those peaks, there are a lot of crosswinds. And if you're not careful, they can really blow, even blow you right off the mountain. And he, he got to the height, and he started to stand on the height, and the guide behind him grabbed him and dragged him down and said, On your knees, sir. You are never safe here except on your knees. And isn't that a great principle for life? That as we walk through the difficulties of life, as we don't understand what's happening in our lives, on our knees, there's safety. God hears the prayers of his people. And it is our humble prayer that will see us through times of confusion. We need Jesus. We need to go to our high priest and ask him for help in our time of need. Which really brings us to the second certainty in Habakkuk's song that he teaches us. And that is that God moves toward the pain of his people. Habakkuk is in pain. The people of Judah are going to be in pain as Babylon invades. And sometimes people feel like, well, if I'm in pain, if I am struggling, then somehow God has removed himself. He's pulling away. Or maybe for Judah, we are so sinful, God's disgusted with us, he will have nothing more to do with us. But this God who sits enthroned in heaven, as he talked about in chapter 2, verse 20, this all-powerful God, is not aloof. He's not remote. He comes. He comes. That's how he begins verse 3. And in these verses that follow, there are a number of allusions to Old Testament stories. Sometimes it's pretty evident what story he's thinking of. Sometimes it's not. But the point that Habakkuk is making is God has acted in the past for his people. He's moved toward them in their pain. And he still does. In fact, though Habakkuk uses past tense verbs here and the ESV translates it as past tense, Habakkuk has in mind a coming right then and a coming in the future. He has in mind in, in his mind's eye or in a vision that he literally saw a theophany, an appearance of God, God coming in the Old Testament to his people in rescue and in help. And so we read in verse 3, which actually parallels an Old Testament passage, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. Stop and think about the fact that God comes to his people. He comes, Habakkuk shows us, in unrivaled glory. In this prayer of Habakkuk, he sees God in all of his glory and he, he adores God for who he is. He's the Holy One, the one who is above all, who is sinless and perfect. And he's the one who comes from those two names that seem sort of meaningless to us. But when you look at the geography, those two areas, Teman and Mount Paran, are near Mount Sinai. And so what Habakkuk is picturing, what Habakkuk is seeing, is God coming from the place where he first met with his people. And he's coming to them from that place and moving into the situation in which they now find themselves. He goes on in verse 3, His splendor covered the heavens. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand. There he veiled his power. And so he pictures perhaps uh, God moving like a, a storm, moving through the situation, moving into the lives of his people. Perhaps in his mind's eye is the Shekinah glory that led Israel in a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. So that shining out of God's glory that led his people. But I think more probably he's thinking about Mount Sinai itself. 
Do you remember the scene on Mount Sinai when the people of Israel gathered to hear from God and God in a cloud comes down and there's thunder and lightning and, and the people say, we're going back to our tents, Moses, you talk to him. He's too awesome for us. And Habakkuk says, this God who comes to the pain of his people is unrivaled in his glory. In fact, we don't even see his full power. His full power is veiled to us because he's too great for us to comprehend. And he comes as a king with an impressive entourage. And so in verse 5, we read, before him went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. And I've capitalized those because I think Habakkuk is, is, is personifying plague and pestilence, things that no ancient person wanted to deal with and neither do we. But he's saying they're just God's servants. They just, you know, they're just kind of following along in his train because he's in charge of them. So when we deal with COVID and monkeypox and uh, the Ebola like Marburg virus that they discovered is around, it's like, great, another one. But none of those surprise God and none of them are out of his power. He controls the uncontrollable even the viruses of this world as he comes not only in unrivaled glory, but in unequaled power. Especially Habakkuk pictures his power over the creation. Look at verse 6. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. So now God stops walking and he stands and he measures the earth, which is just a way of saying it belongs to him so he can measure what's going on. He can see what's happening. And with just a look, he shakes all the nations of the earth and with just a look, he affects the, the mountains themselves. Those mountains that seem like they're eternal and everlasting, he says, they, they, they are scattered, they sink low. He's going to come back to that theme in a minute. But he says, they're not eternal. His ways are what's everlasting. Quite literally, his ways are eternal to eternity. So he doubles the word so that we get the idea that nothing else is permanent, but God is. He's the eternal king. And the nomadic peoples that lived in Kushan and in Midian, maybe an allusion to the conquest of Israel before they enter the land, we're not sure, but whatever it is, he's saying they're, they're in affliction, they're trembling, because if the mountains don't last, what hope is there for their tents? God comes in unequal power without rivals. And so Habakkuk wants us to understand the certainty of God moving in power toward the pain of his people. That he has in the past, that's why he's using past examples. Habakkuk believes he is right as he's writing and he is right now for us and he will continue to so we can cry out to him in prayer because he moves toward the pain of his people. And I don't know what you're going through today. I know what some of you are going through, but not all of you. The difficulties and the suffering. And, and sometimes in those moments we feel like God must be so disgusted with me because I've messed up again or I'm hurting again or in Judah's case we've sinned again. And Habakkuk is saying God loves his people. He moves toward them even in times of pain. Their stage name was Night Birdie. Jane Marcheski, which is a whole lot harder to say than Night Birdie. But she burst onto the national scene as a contestant on the 16th season of America's Got Talent on June 8, 2021. She performed her original song, It's Okay. When she finished, the audience sat stunned and hard and crusty Simon Cowell hit the buzzer to advance her into the live rounds. After the song, she revealed that the cancer which she had battled since 2017 was back in, with a vengeance and was in her liver and her spine and her lungs. And her husband, who had grown tired of the battle with cancer, had left and ended their marriage. Within days, It's Okay was the top song on iTunes. 
But hers was not some kind of Pollyanna-ish faith, some kind of a, well, it'll just all be fine. Even though it doesn't say it in the song, her faith was grounded in her faith in Jesus Christ. People were captivated by how someone going through what she was going through could have hope. She explained in an interview on a podcast, I believe that God can heal in one instant. I also believe that no good thing does he withhold. So there was something God was growing in the field that is me. In a blog post she wrote, maybe we missed it. What God showed us when he first introduced himself to us in Genesis 2, that he will crawl into the dirt to be near us and he will fill our lungs with air when we don't know how to breathe. She writes, I'm still reeling, drenched in sorrow. I'm still begging, bargaining, demanding, disappearing. Kind of sounds like Habakkuk. And I guess that means I have all the more reason to say thank you because God is drawing near me again, again, again. And she goes on to say, you know, there are times when I've pushed him away and he just draws near. Jane went home to heaven on February the 19th of this year. She's nearer, and God is nearer than ever now. But she shows us that principle that God does move toward us in our pain. But if you want the ultimate example, it's Jesus. Because God doesn't look down on our world before Jesus comes and say, boy, they have sure made a mess of it. I'm done with them. Instead, he sends his son into the mess, into the pain. And Jesus is born and he lives a life in our world. And Hebrews says he is tempted at every point like we are without sin. And so he knows what we're going through. That's the ultimate demonstration that God moves toward the pain of his people because he came physically into our world. Habakkuk has one more certainty that he wants to teach us in his song. And that's that God acts to save his people people. He not only moves toward his people, he rescues us. And that, of course, is part of the story of Jesus as well. But it's part of what Habakkuk wants to teach us. And he doesn't even know all about Jesus yet. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows Selah. Habakkuk again gives us some word pictures here to think about our saving God. Stop and think, Selah. And what he wants us to recognize is that God is the powerful deliverer. That there is nothing in your life that he can't save you from. Now he may not do it in your time. He's not doing it for Habakkuk in Habakkuk's time. But he will do it at the right time. He overwhelms the overwhelming floodwaters. He rides across them like they are nothing. In Habakkuk's mind, maybe the crossing of the Jordan River, but I think it's really the crossing of the Red Sea. When God rides across above the waters because he's more powerful than the Red Sea or the Jordan River. In Habakkuk's mind, there may also be a reference to the fact that Near Eastern mythology, Middle Eastern mythology, often deifies the waters. The waters are often viewed as a goddess that's chaotic and troubled. And you'll see in these verses, seven times in verses 8 through 15, he talks about water and floods. But they're not chaotic to God. He just rides across them. Habakkuk says, were you angry with them? The answer is no, he wasn't angry with the Red Sea or the Jordan, he was simply using them as his servant as he rode above the storms. God rides forth, Habakkuk says, as a charioteer in his chariot of salvation to save his people. Maybe a contrast there of God riding in his chariot of salvation to rescue his people and the charioteers of Pharaoh who try to follow the Israelites into the Red Sea and end up drowning while God rides across the top. You strip the sheath from your bow, you pulled the covering off your bow and grabbed a handful of arrows. And I guess because I like old westerns, when I read that, I thought about you know, the gunslinger who 
removes his tie-down strap off his pistol, and he's ready for action. And again, verse 9 is hard grammatically, but I think the bottom line is that God is readying himself for action. He is the powerful deliverer who is coming to rescue his people. He's also the earth shaker. Habakkuk comes back to what God does to the created order. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The deep places, the mountains, they twist and turn in pain. The raging waters are no match for him. In fact, those deep places lift their hands, and you can say in praise or surrender, it's pretty much the same thing. He's in charge. The story is told of a a woman who was living through an earthquake one day, and her children said to her, aren't you afraid? And she said, no, I, I rejoice that I have a God who can shake the earth. And that's kind of what Habakkuk is saying. It's okay. God is in charge. And if he's shaking your earth and your world and your life, it's okay. He's the earth shaker. He's also the undefeatable warrior. Habakkuk pictures him in verse 11, the sun and the moon, which the ancients often deified. They're no match. They stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. And that one's a pretty obvious uh, what he's referring to, isn't it? Joshua, in Joshua 10, when the sun stands still. The very planets and heavenly bodies that the ancients worshipped They're no match for God. He has his glittering spear and his arrows flashing, and boy, we've experienced some of that over the last few weeks in the lightning storms, haven't we? And he's picturing that as God is marching forth in fury. What we looked at last week in chapter 2 is God defeats nation after nation after nation in those woes. Why does he do it? He tells us in verse 13. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. It's the third time he's talked about salvation. He talked about it back in verse 8, and now he talks about it twice here because that's why God comes. He acts to save his people. And then he says, Selah, stop and think about it. Stop and think about the fact that this God is undefeatable. No one ever has, no one ever will defeat him. And because of that, he can save his people. But Habakkuk has one more word picture in the song for us. It says, God is the situation reverser. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. Rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. He says, the Babylonians are sweeping in and they're mocking. They want to scatter me. They want to loot the nation. And and they're winning. But God, you're going to use their own arrows against them. And there were times in Israel's history when that happened. Do you remember Gideon? Gideon and his 300 men surround the Midianite camp, which is too numerous for them to even count. And they smash their jars and hold their torches and blow their trumpets and the Midianites start killing each other. And there are other times in the Old Testament where that happens as well. God reverses situations. And again, he comes back in verse 15 to what he's already said in verse 8. God rides across those surging waters. They're no problem for him. So there's no situation that you face, no battle that's too big in your life for him. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to turn the way you think it ought to. Remember, it's not our plan. It's his plan. But we can trust him. And so that's the third certainty. God acts to save his people. He has in the past. He is right now. And he always will. What Habakkuk has seen in this theophany of God coming is really the answer to his prayer in verse 2. God In these days, carry out your plan. And as you're carrying out your plan, and as the wrath is coming, remember mercy. And God says, I'm coming for my people. 
I'm coming to deliver, to shake the earth, to defeat the enemy, and to reverse what's happening. This is no grandfather in a rocking chair kind of God. This is a God of power, but a God of power that cares for his people. If you want to see the ultimate fulfillment of it, it's in Revelation. It's still future for us. But this is the God who will come someday to deliver you and me, not only from our struggles, but from the very presence of evil in this world. And it may not be in my lifetime or yours, but it is certain. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. See, that's the ultimate answer to our cry of God. How long, when, why? There's coming a day when he will come and righteousness will reign on this earth as Jesus reigns on this earth. He is the eternal king. He is the king who comes for his people. I wonder this morning if he's your king. If you have ever bowed the knee and asked Jesus to be your savior and your king. Because if you don't, then all the things we've been talking about are not true for you. But if you know Jesus, then they are. Habakkuk's questions haven't all been answered. Go back to chapter 1 and see things he asked, and God hasn't answered them. But he knows some things for sure. He knows that God is listening. He knows that God cares about the pain and is moving into the situation and he knows that God acts to save his people. That song teaches us, songs ought to teach us good theology. Habakkuk's does. The greatest proof that this is true is not your experience or mine or Habakkuk's or Israel's. The greatest proof that God hears the prayers of his people and moves into their pain and acts to save them is Jesus. Because God's people prayed, please send the Messiah. And exactly the right time, God sent him. And he lived among us and he lived knowing our suffering and our pain and he lived a sinless life. And then he went to the cross, not to pay for his sins, not to pray, pay for his struggles with God, but to pay for yours and mine. And he died on the cross to rescue us, to deliver us from the power of sin right now in our lives and someday from the very presence of sin in this world. And he rose from the dead and demonstrated that his victory was indeed complete. You want to know for sure how you can know that God cares, that he hears, that he acts? Look at Jesus. Look at the cross. For those of us who know Jesus, it just reminds us that we can trust him, that God has been, that he is, and he will always be worthy of our trust, even when the world and God don't make sense to us. See, God's goal is not to answer all of our questions. Habakkuk didn't have all his questions answered. God's goal isn't to even make us more comfortable to do away with those struggles. His goal is to spur us on to greater faith in him. And that's what's happened in Habakkuk's life. The story is told of years ago, a sailing ship and a sea captain who took his daughter with him on this particular voyage. And one night, a horrific storm came up and the father sent a crewman down to keep an eye on his daughter. Meanwhile, other passengers were gathering in the hallways and on deck, fearful for their very lives in the storm. And the little girl woke up. And she looked at the crewman and said, what are you doing here? Well, your father sent me down. She said, well, what's happening? Well, there's a really, really bad storm. She looked back at him and she said, is my father on the bridge? Yes, he is. She rolled over and went back to sleep. See, I want you to know, folks, that your father's on the bridge. 
If you know Jesus, God is in control. And though we don't get all our questions answered, and though we may be uncomfortable, we can trust Him. And next week, the Lord willing, we're going to see the end of Habakkuk's song and what he learned about trusting God. Let's pray together. And so, Father, we come to you admitting that we're a lot like Habakkuk, that we look around at a world that seems so chaotic. We may look at our lives and see brokenness and difficulty and pain, and we wonder why. Why aren't you doing something? We think you should do something. How long is this going to go on, and how do I get through it? But Lord, help us to learn with Habakkuk that we can trust you, that you hear our cries and you know our pain and you will act in your time at the right time and help us to live by faith until that day comes. And so as we leave here, Lord, and we go out into a world that really is broken, help us to shine as lights and help us to be salt as we deal with the challenges and the issues of daily life, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be down here in front. Pastor Steve will as well. Pastor Ryan and Pastor Jim are around. If we can help you with something, we would be glad to do that. In the meantime, the Lord bless you. Have a great week. If you're staying for pizza with the pastors, join us up there shortly. Thank you. You're dismissed.